All right, hello and welcome back. So you can see that we have a massive upgrade. I now have lights. I have very good green screen. I have moved my microphone closer. So now the reaction videos have increased in 10,000 production quality or whatever. Anyway, so we're going to be looking or reacting to the Battle of Berlin by the Armchair Historian. If you want to watch the full video without me pausing it every six seconds, I highly recommend you do that by clicking the original video in the description and you can go ahead and give them a like. This is more in depth. Um, if you don't like me pausing every six seconds or something like that, then watch the original video. Otherwise, let's get to it. It is February 1945. Soldiers of the Soviet 8th Guards Army stand in silence as they observe the rays of the morning sun glisten on the icy waters of the Oder River. Among them is the war correspondent Vasily Grossman. Vasily has covered the war since the Battle of Moscow. And like his comrades in arms, he has counted every river he has crossed since the advance westward from the Volga at Stalingrad. Now, after a hellish trek of over three years, he stands at the bank of the final river before Berlin. Caught by the emotion of the moment, he writes, Мне захотелось крикнуть, позвать тех братьев бойцов, что лежат на русской, украинской, белорусской и польской земле. Спят вечным сном на поле брани. Товарищи, слышите вы нас? Мы дошли. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian. By early 1945, Hitler's Third Reich was on its last legs. While the Allies prepared to make a dash across the Rhine, in the east, the Red Army was advancing toward the German border at lightning speed. As its armies closed in on Berlin, its men vowed to take revenge for the death and destruction the Germans had brought upon the motherland. Hitler, however, would not go down without a fight, and forced his defeated people into one more cataclysmic bloodletting that would not end until the hammer and sickle finally flew above the Reichstag and the Fuhrer lay dead in his underground bunker. 1944 had been nothing short of a disaster for the Germans on the Eastern Front. After the annihilation of Army Group Center, the seemingly unstoppable Red Army had chased the Wehrmacht to the gates of Warsaw. So I haven't said anything. I feel like you say something now. So, 1945. We're gonna go up and down this line, okay? So, 1945, as they said, Germany looks very bad. Um, Everyone at this point knew the war was going to end, um, and it was a short victory. They just didn't know how long it would take. So, 1945, by the time Berlin happens, Bulgaria and Romania have both swapped sides. They are now fighting for the Soviet Union with any remaining forces that they have at this point. Yugoslavia is currently liberating itself um, <laughs> with the help of now the Soviet Union. They're... They've already technically liberated half themselves, so they're they're basically liberated at this point. Um, any forces down here are that they exist on paper. <sighs> Hungary at this point is going to receive some of the la well, the Germans tried to reinforce Bucharest because they wanted to Hitler wanted to get some oil that was down in Bucharest instead of Budapest. Sorry, I messed that up. Budapest. He was wanting to try the oil fields in Bucharest. Um, so he sent his last panzer reserves, his last panzer reserves, his only reserves that he has anything left in 45 down here to smash through to get oil. Now that makes strategic sense, but unfortunately, um, your last reserves, and I can criticize him now because he's dead and this, his generals told him this anyway. Hey, my Führer, we should, uh, oh, I don't know, put those panzers to the defense of Berlin. They weren't used there. Slovakia at this point is having a lot of turmoil. <laughs> um, I don't remember if they switched sides, but I don't think so. It doesn't really matter. They're gone anyway. And army, as you said, army group center, um, I guess the Soviets is gone. It, it got obliterated in 44 and 45. Um, so. In the south, Romania and Bulgaria had capitulated and changed sides, while Hungary verged on collapse as Soviet armies laid siege to Budapest. Unwilling to admit defeat, Hitler now made the momentous decision to deploy his final armored reserves to relieve the city's defenders and secure Hungary's oil fields. 
every single one of these emblems you see right here is a division. These divisions were so under strength, it's fun. It's laughable. They also had an SS detachment here. And of course, I don't know what all of these symbols mean because um, I'm not a division expert for Germany. Um, but those are the divisions that they were sent. A lot of them existed on paper with some Panzer IVs and really whatever they could scrape together at this point. It wasn't anything big to relieve the defenses at Budapest. And it doesn't work. Budapest gets encircled and they have to try to break out with anybody they have. This, as it turned out, was exactly what the Soviet High Command, better known as the Stavka, had hoped for. By increasing pressure on the Hungarian front, Stalin and his advisors aimed to lure the Fuhrer into moving his vital armored reserves away from Poland. While three Soviet fronts, totaling some 2.5 million men, would make a dash across the Vistula River around Warsaw and drive straight toward Berlin. To mentally prepare their men for the coming struggle, political commissars handed out instructions that echoed the overwhelming sentiment felt among the embittered Soviet soldiers. The soldier's rage in battle must be terrible. He does not merely seek to fight, he must also be the embodiment of the court of his people's justice. Fueled by a desire for revenge, Stalin's armies began breaking out of their bridgeheads on January 12th. Within days, the outgunned defenders were forced into a frenzied retreat. On the 15th, General Heinz Guderian pleaded with Hitler to send every available unit east. The Führer, in turn, made great promises in the form of two SS Panzer Corps recently withdrawn from the Ardennes. However, rather than arriving to salvage the situation in Poland, they were thrown into yet another one of Hitler's armored pipe dreams in Hungary. Lacking sufficient mobile reserves, the bulk of the ill-fated German defenders were encircled and destroyed. As the catastrophe unfolded, the Berlin radio broadcasted apocalyptic news bulletins which compared the advancing Red Army to the Mongol hordes, the Huns, and the Tartars, who were out to bring total destruction and the end of civilization. Driven by fear, a growing mass of German refugees began a long, deadly march across the icy roads leading westward in hopes of eluding the jaws of Soviet vengeance. The dreaded Red Horde, however, was moving at lightning speed, and by the end of January, its armies had advanced some 500 kilometers, or nearly 311 miles, to the banks of the Oder River, just 60 kilometers, or 37 miles, from Berlin. So these refugees, there are... I can't say those words. Um, they start with R. <laughs> um, of women were fleeing the Soviet lines. And this will continue to happen after the war, too. Millions of Germans will die. Um, from or Millions of refugees are displaced. A million or so or more die. Um, because they, again, it's winter, and they have to pack all of their stuff up on horses and buggies and wagons and go west against the Soviet horde. And as they said, Goebbels was a propaganda master and genius. If you give him anything, that's what you should give him. He really was. Um, and Berlin is, if you look at a map, Berlin is very far east in Germany. Um, it is ne very near Poland, how far, how close this capital is to the east. Um, so that is going to be a problem. And as they said, Heinz Guderian was like, hey, bud, uh, how about... <coughs> We don't waste our panzer divisions that we don't have any fuel for um, that can't even make the encirclements that they would need to in a pipe dream to take the Soviets out in Hungary. Send them north to hell, or really, this is the center, to defend the capital. And they're just, nope, Hitler's in a pipe dream at this point, so... However, the rapid advance had stretched the Red Army's logistics to their limit, and heavy resistance in East Prussia had left Marshal Georgi Zhukov's flank dangerously exposed to counterattack from German troops massing in Pomerania. As a result, the Stavka decided to halt the final assault on Berlin until the flanks were secured. By mid-April, the Red Army had reached the oder neisse River line on a front that stretched from Stetten in the north to the Czech border in the south. And there was a lot of civilian liners trying to escape with thousands and thousands of refugees at this point out of here. 
if I remember correctly, there this is the story. There was a German ship with 10,000 people on it, all citizens and some soldiers and really the wounded to escape out of Danzig. Or, I don't know if they'll show it up here, the pocket in Estonia in the Baltic area countries up there. Um, either way, the story ends with a Soviet sub firing a torpedo into the ship and basically killing 9,800 and something. Basically, everyone dies. And the people that did that get, you know, heroes of the Soviet Union. So, again, the expulsion and the flight of the Germans at this point is just to get west as fast as you can. There are forces still in Danzig. There's a lot of people here. Because, again, one, they were cut off when they these advanced happened. Two, they also weren't really allowed to leave under orders from Hitler. Again, the same thing happen, is happening in the Estonia region um, and the Baltics up there. There's uh, the Group North was told to hold your positions when they could have gotten out. And there's 200,000 Germans up there, uh, German soldiers, so they could have been used for the defense of Berlin. But long story short, no. Uh, fight to the last. Don't lose any ground. So. The eyes of the world were now converging on Berlin as Stalin's armies prepared for their final act of vengeance that would eradicate Nazi Germany once and for all. Although the Allies had promised to leave Berlin to the Red Army, the ever-paranoid Stalin still urged haste in the capture of the city. The final plan called for a three-pronged attack on the Berlin Axis to encircle and capture the city within 12 to 15 days, then move on to meet the Allies at the Elba River. Zhukov's first Belarusian front would be at the center of the thrust, while Marshal Ivan Konev's first Ukrainian front to the south was set to attack across the Niza River in the direction of Potsdam and Dresden. Finally, Marshal Konstantin Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front would tie down German forces to the north in the Stettin Schwedt sector to prevent them from reinforcing Berlin. As I said, so Rokossovsky and Zhukov. So as the story goes, Stalin's like, whoever gets to Berlin first gets the glory. <laughs> Which is going to actually lead to a lot of unnecessary Soviet casualties, because again, Zhukov and uh, the commander of the Belarusian Front that I just said his name, that I completely forgot by now, um, are going to basically fight to get into Berlin first, because again, that's more prestigious in the Soviet system of government that they have at this time, um, when Stalin says take Berlin. Uh, first Ukrainian front guy probably will try to do so, but he, again, he's probably just too far. Anyway, I do know that these two pincer pockets are fighting to get to Berlin first. Having become accustomed to fighting on wide open terrain, few in the Red Army had much experience in large-scale urban street fighting. It was up to General Vasily Troikov's 8th Guards Army, veterans of the Battle of Stalingrad, to distribute pamphlets on urban warfare while special combined arms task forces were formed. Red Army engineers, on their part, worked day and night to construct hundreds of bridges and thousands of wooden assault boats to cross the Oder and Niza rivers. To achieve this, Soviet planners had to find a way to move 29 armies over hundreds of kilometers to create shock groups capable of penetrating the German line in areas only 2.5 to 10 kilometers or 1.5 to 6 miles in width. When it was all said and done, the Red Army would advance on Berlin with some 2.5 million men, 6,250 tanks and self-propelled guns, and 7,500 combat aircraft. Aiming now, these aren't all going to fight in the Battle of Berlin. That's a little different, even though it's called the Battle of Berlin. This is just the Berlin sector that those 2.5 million people are in, um, which means everything up here is going to be included in that. To make the invaders bleed for every inch of German soil, the Wehrmacht constructed a series of well-entrenched defensive lines which barricaded the way into Berlin. Manning these positions were the remains of Army Group Vistula and 4th Panzer Army, as well as the Berlin Garrison. Combined, this force consisted of 750,000 German soldiers, supported by 1,519 tanks and assault guns, 9,303 guns and mortars, and 2,200 aircraft. However, these numbers looked more impressive on paper than they did in reality, as virtually all of its formations were under strength. Yeah, basically. This army, even the 766,000 people, is, is really just a paper number. Um, this is technically, you know, what they should have, but I, 
doesn't exist. Although many units were led by battle-hardened veterans of the Eastern Front, their rank and file was often made up of a mix of wounded, unfit, and inexperienced soldiers, and even boys from the Hitler Youth. Moreover, some 60,000 of the defenders came from undertrained and barely armed Volkssturm militia battalions. So, let's, let's talk about this. So yes, the, the bulk of them, a lot, I mean, just the bodies, let's just put it that way. Any of the combat units is different. The, the bodies with the Volkstrom, so people's storm. Old men, young boys, everyone that was too old to fight, everyone that was too young to fight, okay? Any of the Hitler Youth at this point would have been formed into the Hitler Jung or Hitler Youth Division or Hitler, he had an SS division named after him, so SS Adolf Hitler. I believe it was the first uh, SS division. They will start using boys of 15 or 16 at this point if they can get their hands on them. Otherwise, they're, any SS at this point are going to try and get any of the Hitler Youth. They can't. Anyone that is left over, um, usually divisions are going, some some divisions, some battalions are going to be reformed into Volks Grenadiers. Okay? Now, this is a little different. Volks Grenadiers, so means people's grenadiers, um, they are very different from uh Volkstrom, okay, so people's storm. Volks grenadiers are guys that were wounded that have combat experience, but they were taken out of the army or now put back into the army. So they actually have pretty significant combat experience and they're pretty good, but there's not a lot of them left. Some 60,000 of the defenders came from undertrained and barely armed Volkstrom militia battalions. And those 60,000 I'll just tell you right now, whatever militia you think you're putting together at 60, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They're going to run. They don't have the training. It, they're really, they're just there to block units for a few hours and be meat shields at that point. They, they're not going to stand up to the veteran Soviet division that they are facing. And all of them basically are guards units. And the difference between a regular Soviet uh, division and a guard division is guard divisions are usually sent into the thickest fire. They take a lot of casualties. Usually, they're volunteers um, that want to fight really hard. <laughs> Usually. But anyway, guards get, you know, very dangerous assignments. So. The infantry would not be able to count much on its armored and air assets either. As Any air assets that the Third Reich had at this point are just paper. They don't exist. After, after the Battle of the Bulge, they used every single aircraft reserve they had left. Aircraft were gone. Uh, the Soviets are going to have complete air superiority in this entire battle. Any tanks they do have left, they can basically be used in a static position because they don't have any fuel. None of the crews are trained. So in reality, they're just a, basically a sitting pillbox. As the Germans lacked the fuel reserves to keep its otherwise considerable force of fighting vehicles operational for any extended period of time. Morale was also at an all-time low. Most suffered from malnutrition and a lack of hygiene. And save for the most fanatical Nazis, few now believed in the promise of final victory. Even so, every effort was made to convince the men that the much-anticipated Wunderwaffen would still turn the tide of the war, and that peace talks with the Western allies were soon to bear fruit. But if these motivations were only marginally effective, the widespread fear of Soviet vengeance and barbarism drove even the most cynical to continue fighting. Now that is very true. All of the, everyone knew this war was going over. Now you may ask why none of them were really trying to surrender. It's very simple. The Soviets in their minds would kill them. And it turned out to relatively be true. Um, especially after the war with the prisoners of war. They knew. All these German soldiers, people, whoever was on the front line at this point, knew that the war was basically over. But their best shot of getting anything out of this war was to get to the West, the Allies in the West. Surrendering in the East was not an option. They would run miles, hundreds of miles, hundreds of kilometers to get to the Allies in the West. Um, there are guys, and again, in the Battle of Berlin after Hitler is dead, that try to escape to the Western lines rather than the East, because they know they'll be dead in the East. If you're SS in the East, you are dead. It's very simple. This fanatical ability to keep fighting against... Again, you have to think, this is a war of annihilation. Uh, the, the Germans and the Soviets are fighting. They will kill each other until there is none left. So the Germans have been doing that 
with the camps and everything they have been doing in the East, all the war crimes, they fear that reta retaliation. So that's why they're going to fight pretty damn hard. Fear of Soviet vengeance and barbarism drove even the most cynical to continue fighting. On April 12th, the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra gave its last performance. Among the music played was Richard Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries. Four days later, another type of orchestra began to play. And that was true of this orchestra. And another few things here. This orchestra was the last that Albert Speer and Goebbels, I believe, saw. I don't remember if Hitler was here. I don't think so. But this is the last orchestra that they would play. And if I remember correctly, Albert Speer ordered them to play the orchestra, um, Ride of the Valkyries. <laughs> um, and it's just symbolism at that point. Even knew he knew that it was just symbolism of what's about to happen. Play as thousands of Katyusha rocket launchers and field guns of Zhukov's front opened up on the first German defensive line along the Zelo Heights. Miles away in Berlin's eastern suburbs, houses began to shake as terrified citizens gathered in the street to listen to the start of the coming storm. A stunned Russian engineer described the unfolding spectacle. Along the whole length of the horizon, it was bright as daylight. On the German side, everything was covered with smoke and thick foundations of earth in clumps flying up. There were huge flocks of scared birds flying around in the sky, a constant humming, thunder, explosions. We had to cover our ears to prevent our eardrums breaking. As the sound of artillery gradually faded, hundreds of men began shouting, to Berlin, as tank engines roared and the lead assault elements began advancing toward the heights. Many of the German defenders, unfortunate enough to have been caught in the preceding onslaught, had disappeared in the blink of an eye, while dazed and panic-stricken survivors rushed back toward the second defensive line. However, the awesome bombardment obscured serious problems in Zhukov's plan. The destruction caused by the shelling had been so great in scope that it had severely worsened the condition of the terrain that his men now had to traverse. The searchlights, intended to blind the enemy, instead reflected onto the smoke-filled air and obscured the vision of the advancing infantry. In the resulting chaos, units lost contact with each other as Soviet artillery and aircraft began attacking friendly formations. Worse still, German intelligence had had prior knowledge of the coming offensive, which meant that many of the first-line troops had been evacuated to the safety of the rear. What ensued was nothing less than what a member of the Gross Deutschland Guard Regiment described as a slaughterhouse. Countless soldiers were cut down as SS Gross Deutschland, so you know SS uh, Germania. This artillery bombardment, again, you pummeled the ground into its complete submission. And when they rolled their tanks over, well, you know, you can't move because there's craters everywhere. Also, the fact that friendly fire is happening, but that's going to happen either way. The searchlights really don't help anything. Also, uh, Luftwaffe, actually Fallschirmjägers. As they struggled to advance across the floodplains and through German minefields. In other sectors too, the attackers were cut down and repulsed as they attempted to cross the Oder. Sensing disaster, an increasingly agitated Zhukov ordered his two tank armies to attack at once. However, most of the infantry's artillery and supply vehicles were still trying to make their way to the front, causing the tank armies to become hopelessly stuck in an endless traffic jam. Even when the lead armor finally approached the heights, they found themselves ambushed by concealed 88 gun emplacements, Tiger I tanks, and infantry armed with deadly Panzerfaust recoilless anti-tank launchers. Again, the heights outside of Berlin are actually very defensible. Um, and again, this was with whatever units they could scrape up. This wasn't even any of their good units that they had left. There are some that will play a pivotal point in the actual battle later. But again, the Panzer Reserves have been sent to Hungary. The Northern Army is not allowed to evacuate. There are guys in Danzig still. Um, all those guys, again, if you think about it, what just a scraped together army that has really conscripts are going for it is able to do these two Soviet fronts is quite impressive. It's actually very impressive, honestly. Um, and imagine if they had another 600,000 Germans, um, which they easily could have. Let's not get into that. They easily could have had another 600,000 to 
main defenses around Berlin, but you know, they didn't, so. Unsurprisingly, Zhukov's decimated men had made little progress at the end of the first day, and it would take three more days and countless more dead before his armies finally forced their way through the final defensive line. Naturally, Stalin was infuriated, but he could rest easy in the fact that Konev's front to the south had seen more success. By the end of April the 18th, his tank armies were across the Spree River and were racing toward Berlin. Lacking sufficient reinforcements and ammunition, the surviving defenders in both sectors were forced into a headlong retreat. With the German defensive lines in the south and in the center broken, and with vital troops in the north still tied down in heavy fighting, the road to Berlin lay open. Lacking the supplies to keep on fighting, German morale now visibly began to collapse. Thousands of encircled men surrendered, while masses of stragglers, deserters, and refugees made their way into the doomed city. All the while, an increasingly delusional Hitler continued to demand fanatical resistance until the bitter end. On April 20th... And again, they broke the defenses again, so the Soviets are going to take heavy casualties. At this point, they're just numbers. <laughs> Let's be very honest with ourselves. At this point, they're not trying to reduce their casualty count. They're just trying to capture Berlin as fast as possible. They could take their time, but they don't want to. They want to get Berlin and then end this war. Um, so that's what their plan is, and it's working quite well, quite honestly. And again, the German fronts have completely collapsed now. The ones around the south and the center are gone. So there is really... There's an SS unit in Berlin that will defend to the last SS de Charlemagne, or SS das, das Charlemagne. So, named after King Charlemagne. If you know your history, he's the first king of the Franks. Um, he's the first king of the French king of the Franks, though. Um, and that's who they're named after. They're all French volunteers. I've been scripted. They're volunteers in the SS. The Fuhrer's birthday was rudely interrupted by Soviet artillery shelling Berlin's northeastern suburbs. As its citizens fled into cellars, Zhukov and Konev's tank armies began a frantic race to the city's outskirts. In the meantime, many senior officials of the Nazi party engaged in a similar type of competition to be the first one to get permission to flee the city. Soldiers on the ground enjoyed no such privileges and those who tried to run or displayed signs of cowardice were summarily hanged throughout the city with messages such as, I was a coward, or I was a deserter, dangling from their chests. The next- yeah, I mean, when you start having to hang people in your own city for them not fighting, it's over. What did that, I mean, at that point, you're just killing your own people just to kill your own people. Next morning, Soviet artillery fired a frenzied barrage into Berlin's city center, while the remains of General Helmut Weidling's 56th Panzer Corps of the German 9th Army conducted a desperate withdrawal across Berlin's Autobahn ring, while being mercilessly strafed by Soviet aircraft. As, as again I said, there was literally zero German air at this point. I mean, if they, they could probably get a few fighters up from a few guys, but that was really it. Everything they had was used in the Battle of the Bulge. Other remnants of the German defense attempted in vain to stop Zhukov's armies from pushing into the city from the southwestern and northern flanks. However, its depleted units could only delay the enemy, and Zhukov and Konev's forces both reached the city's outskirts that evening. Believing himself to be the next Frederick the Great, Hitler remained confident that a massive counterstroke by the newly created Army Detachment Steiner and 9th Army against Zhukov's flanks would trap the invaders in the city in a ploy similar to what had befallen the Germans at Stalingrad two years prior. When it became clear on the following day that Steiner's Army Detachment lacked sufficient strength and ammunition to attack, the- It didn't just lack. It literally had none. If I remember correctly, Steiner had like a few naval battalions of guys and Hitler Youth and anything they could scrape up and they couldn't do anything. They had basically infantry with a rifle versus an entire division of guards. They couldn't, they literally couldn't do anything. Steiner told Hitler, <laughs> Steiner told his boss, Keitel, um, no, I'm not doing this. This is stupid. And then just hung up. And I mean, at that point, why would you not? And he is an SS man. Think about that, too. Uh. The 
Fuhrer finally cracked and openly admitted for the first time that all was hopelessly lost. With the Soviets breaking into the city, General Weidling was appointed commander of the Berlin Defense Area. However, by the time Weidling took command, only about 45,000 Wehrmacht and SS troops, just over 40,000 men of the Volkssturm, and a measly 60 fuel-starved tanks were left standing to defend the city against some 1.5 million Soviet troops. And if you watch the movie Downfall, they they call this guy in and he's basically they're like have you you fallen back so therefore you're a traitor so you're gonna get shot, um, and then he's in the bunker for that. And then also in the movie Downfall, um, Keitel comes out and basically says, "Hey, you've been made commander of the Berlin defenses." And his response is, "I would have rather been shot." <laughs> yeah, it it's over at this point and everyone knows it. Also, fun fact: these little stripes here are used for. So there was a plan, this is a little going off on a tangent, there was a plan that if any um, allied aircraft or, or any allied units were to meet, um, they would be able to identify each other and not shoot the crap out of each other. Because, again, no Americans had any seen any Soviet tanks and no Soviets had ever seen American tanks. So these white stripes, again, they're called like Battle of Berlin stripes at this point because they were really just used there. That was really it. Uh, again, on the whole front, I'm not... 100% on that, but basically what these are is basically um, just stripes around the tank that are white for identification from aircraft and also identification that you are friendly to other allied units, including the West, if I remember correctly, which I'm pretty sure it is. And then um, there were other identifications used on allied tanks. Allied tanks would put, a, you know, the star, the U.S. star, and then the circle. Well, it wasn't really U.S., but anyway a star and a circle on the back of their back of their tanks on the back of the engine deck so that you could see above and you could be like oh that is a white tank don't blow up the white tank so um. and a reason for that is because they had complete allied air superiority they were more they were more concerned that their own aircraft would start blowing themselves like blowing their own tanks up rather than the enemy aircraft because the enemy aircraft don't exist anymore and you don't want to shoot your own uh, vehicles, so yeah, that was why. Unsurprisingly, Zhukov's armies had managed to push the defenders out of the eastern and southeastern suburbs by the end of the 23rd, while other fronts tightened their grasp around the city's flanks. With inevitable defeat looming on the horizon, many of the defenders began to lay down their arms. Others, however, continued to resist fanatically. At the Tempelhof airport, a mixed group of SS-led German defenders, including some 100 Hitler youth, wreaked havoc on the attacking Soviet tanks and infantry, who had to resort to massive aerial and artillery bombardment to finally capture the airport a day later. By that time, the encirclement of Berlin had been completed. However, a manic Hitler promised Weidling that yet another massive counteroffensive by General Wenck's 12th Army in the southwest was sure to come to the rescue of the beleaguered defenders. Wenck, however, had no intention on embarking in a futile suicide mission, and instead moved to relieve encircled German troops further to the east. And he's just trying to get them out to the west at this point, not to the surrender to the Soviets. Yeah, even he, he this was over. And again, they do mention it kind of in the throwaway line, but they completed the encirclement of Berlin. That was the whole point of going with these two uh, two spearheads. It was to encircle Berlin. One, it makes tactical sense. Okay, that's priority number one. It makes tactical sense to secure the city around Berlin so no reinforcements can pour into it. Two, politically, that's what they wanted to do. No allied unit was getting into their, into their Berlin. No western unit was coming anywhere into Berlin. That's... The, the second main reason that they did that encirclement. First, military. Second, political. With no further hope of relief, Weidling urged the Fuhrer to stage a breakout westward to join up with remnants of Army Group Vistula. Hitler, however, rejected the plan and restated his intention to fall at the head of his troops. During the next three days, the Red Army tightened its hold on Berlin as the advancing armies closed in on the inner defensive line, protecting the governmental district. The lack of clear demarcation lines between the fronts, however, led to various formations competing for space and getting hopelessly confused in the ensuing quagmire. After careful deliberation, it was decided that most of Konov's frustrated men were to be redeployed to Czechoslovakia, while Zhukov was to go in for the final kill. By the and 
Yeah, so there you go. That's that's Soviet leadership for you right there. Um, and Hitler refused to leave Berlin. Now, this is kind of oxymoron when you think about it, because he absolutely hated Berlin. He detested everything about Berlin. He detested the modernity, so the modernity of Berlin. He hated everything about this place, but he refused to leave. He much preferred his Alpine retreats. He much preferred Bavaria, which why would you not prefer Bavaria? Bavaria is great. Uh, he liked it. Bavaria is very nice. Um, but again, he absolutely detested Berlin, but he wouldn't leave because he knew if he left, well, one, his empire is gone. He wants to die at it, so fine. And two, I mean, if he escapes, everyone just surrenders. And again, this is the Reich's Chancellor here and the Reichstag here. The Reichstag is where is where the former parliament um, was dissolved in thirty three, and where the entire um, Weimar Republic actually met was here. Um, but it had been burned in a fire that I could get into later about what actually happened there. Flat towers, Reich Chancellor, and again, these flat towers are actually very heavily defended. And fun fact about these flat towers: they were so heavily defended. The Soviets didn't even bother trying to take them out. I mean, they tried, but they literally couldn't break them. Um, so the, this is the one funny fact. All flak towers in Berlin um, surrendered after Hitler was dead and they took everything else out. They literally couldn't crack the amount of heavy defenses on the flak towers. And they had thousands of civilians, tens of thousands of civilians in them, um, along with their defenders. And after... Germany, uh, after the Ber basically after the Battle of Berlin, they actually surrendered. So, by the end of the 29th, the Eighth Guards Army had blasted its way through the heavily defended Tiergarten sector, while the Third Shock Army had crossed the Spree over the Moltke Bridge just to the north. In front of them lay the ultimate prize, the blackened walls of the Reichstag, the former parliamentary building widely regarded as the symbolic heart of the Third Reich. Capturing it would be nothing less than the culmination of the entire Soviet war effort. The defense of the building and its surroundings was led by a determined group of mostly foreign SS fighters with little less to lose. Again, they were the SS de Charlemagne um, fighters from France. And again, Germany actually, the German defenders tried to blow these bridges, but they didn't want to blow. <laughs> they were too well built, if you think about that. In the morning of the following day, Soviet artillery opened fire as a few hundred assault troops rushed forward. After a heavy firefight, the men reached the main entrance and proceeded to clear the building in brutal close quarters combat. After hours of bitter fighting, the Red Banner was spotted hanging from the second floor at around 2.30 p.m. But it wouldn't be until late in the evening before a path to the roof had finally been cleared. Two sergeants, identified as Mikhail Yegorov and Melaton Kantaria, managed to reach the top and hoisted the hammer and sickle on top of the Reichstag, marking the symbolic end of Hitler's Third Reich. As this historic moment unfolded, an even more momentous event occurred barely a kilometer away, with Soviet troops converging on his bunker complex. Uh, let me go back to this. Okay, so there's, there's something a little inconsistent here. I don't know if you mentioned it. So again, they waved the flag out that the Reichstag had gotten to the second floor. Now, most of the assault troops at this point that are going in here have literally nothing but submachine guns and grenades, and they'll just keep going out, getting more, and coming back in and just shooting the crap out of everything, which is what you do. And a German defender, you're basically dead. I mean, you're just waiting to die. This symbolic flag raising um, does not happen actually on the, the entire day. Um, they clear out the entire Reichstag. It's the day after... Um, is when they actually take this fam famous photo. You can see it. And it's also one of the most famous photos because it's also doctored. The guy was wearing like nine watches on his... Uh, this guy was wearing nine watches or something on his uh, wrist. And they couldn't... <laughs> they photo doctored it so that it covered it up because, again, you know, nine watches you're stealing, so it looks bad. But anyway, this the famous photo, if you ever look up like Berlin flag photo, that's actually a photo uh, staged event. It's also photoshopped. And it's the day after the battle because a lot of the smoke had actually cleared by this point. This bunker complex, the embittered Fuhrer knew that he had reached the end of the line. The German people had failed him and his vision of a thousand year Reich. After giving Weidling the go ahead to attempt a belated breakout, the Fuhrer said his farewells to his remaining staff, poisoned his dog Blondie, and retired to his study room to commit suicide together with his newly wedded bride, Ava Brown. 
So yes, the dog was named Blondie, and Hitler actually loved this dog. Eva Brown hated Blondie. She tried to poison him, kill this dog, get it run over, do whatever. She absolutely hated dogs, which is like an oxymoron when you think about it. He loves this dog. She absolutely detests this dog and would try to kill it on multiple occasions. Um, and she would say this with, again, friends around that I hate this dog and would kick this dog. Yeah, she's not a very good person. This was on not a very good person. Could you imagine the person that married Hitler was not a very good person? ...poisoned his dog Blondie and retired to his study room to commit suicide together with his newly wedded bride, Ava Brown. But Hitler's death did not put... Supposedly what happened here is they both bit the, bit the cyanide uh, and then basically they, they shot. Uh, he shot her, if I remember correctly, and then shot himself. Um, that's at least the story how it goes from what I remember. Cyanide, shoots her, shoots himself. Uh, at least this were, we have recorded from a secretary and his doctor before you know, they burned them. I mean, they were they were miles outside. They were like a mile outside the Reichstag when this happened. And immediate sorry, not Reichstag, the Reichs Chancellery, different place. The Reichs bunker, really. Immediate end to the fighting. The new chancellor, Josef Goebbels, rejected Stalin's demand for an unconditional surrender of the garrison, prompting the Red Army to blast the remaining German positions until the defense was reduced to little more than a few isolated pockets. Now, as you can see, as I said, these flak towers right here, they held out. They were literally the last things to hold out. So when people say, oh, yeah, defenses don't work. No, they do. Um, they do if you build them very well, which these towers, I don't think they're in Berlin anymore. I believe they ripped them all down in Berlin, but they are in Austria, uh, in Vienna, if I remember correctly. They're still there. But these towers are so well built. They tried to, I believe correctly, they tried to blow them up and it was just too expensive to blow these towers up. They were very well defended um, and very well built. And they're the last things to fall. You know, the Reich Chancellor falls first and then, and then they'll just give up after that. With Goebbels' subsequent suicide being announced that night, the door to peace in Berlin could finally be opened. At Let's talk about Goebbels. Okay, so as he said, Goebbels' suicide. Glossing over a lot of gory details, but I'll just summarize it really quickly for you. He and his wife put their children in the bunker. Hitler told him to run. He said he'd rather die than, you know, run. And him and his children would also rather die, even though he made the choice for them. So the wife gave all of them basically cyanide, and they all died in their sleep. All six-something children. Um, then they went outside. Um, and if I remember, long story short, I don't remember if he, I'm pretty sure he bites cyanide and shoots himself, but I believe he shoots his wife and then he bites cyanide and shoots himself. And then he, he tells anybody that's left at that point to burn his bodies as well. But, you know. A little more than a few isolated pockets. With Goebbels' subsequent suicide being announced that night, the door to peace in Berlin could finally be opened. At 6 a.m. on May 2nd, General Weidling officially ordered his remaining men to lay down their arms. When the guns finally fell silent in the afternoon, an eerie silence descended on the city of which Choykov would later write, the flame of world war was quenched there, whence it arose. The last thing is, so technically, the deputy, so the person I was supposed to take over after Hitler was Goering. But long story short, Hitler thought Goering betrayed him, and he kind of did, um, was going to Vienna, um and assumed command when hitler was still alive which was his mistake should have assumed command after he was dead which is what the plan was so hitler ordered was ordered him to be arrested by ss men which is what they did um but again hitler died before you could, you know kill him anyway the person after um goering that will take over now is dernitz and dernitz will be the one that officially surrenders germany although fighting in europe would continue until germany's unconditional surrender on may 8th the war had come to a climax at the Battle of Berlin. The capture of Germany's capital had cost the Red Army an estimated 78,000 men killed in action and over 274,000 wounded. In return, the Germans had lost some 90 to 100,000 men killed in action, as well as at least another 200,000 wounded. During their advance into Germany, the vengeful Red Army had left a trail of pillage and destruction in its wake. An estimated 95,000 to 130,000 women in Berlin alone are said to have been sexually assaulted, of which 10,000 would later commit suicide. We will just use that term 
and I will not use what I was going to say. Just know that there was a lot of Soviet German babies after the war. Still, many Germans were relieved that the conflict was finally over, and that a semblance of normal human life was slowly returning under shared allied Soviet occupation. However, the alliance between the two victors would prove short-lived, and the start of the Cold War would usher a new type of crisis in the city, which had suffered so much during the Second World War. So very good video, and as I said, the, the alliance between the West and the East was about to deteriorate very fast. Um, I don't know why Eisenhower, and I do blame Eisenhower here, thought that this would last, but long story short, doesn't. Basically dies in 45. So, hope you guys liked that video. Uh, leave your guys' comments down below. Hopefully you have something commentful and informative to say. Um, otherwise... I will uh, put a video up there from uh, my previous video in the Armchair Story that you can go check out if you wish. Otherwise, I will see people later. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Uh,